Okay. Hi, everybody. How are you? Welcome, 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 welcome to Through the Eyes of Others. This is a wonderful Wednesday night. I think they call it hump day, but all of my days are good because they connect to the next one. And so um, this is this is really all right. Um, we have missed talking to you. We're glad that we're here tonight. Um, I'm from the scenic studios of PRN and um, Lisa Kay is down there in South Carolina. Uh, I believe we have real great conversation tonight. It's interesting conversation because of the life and the role that the person that is coming on to hang out with us plays in community. So we're going to have a good time tonight. Um, make sure you are sharing this. Make sure that you are getting this conversation out to to everyone. All right. Um, through the eyes of others is conversation about the emotional residue that many people are experiencing as a result of watching real life being being lived. And so what we like to do is be able to present to you people whose lives um, we, we love to connect to and we wanna be able to see life through their eyes and understand the vicarious trauma that is attached to um, just being here. My sidekick, Lisa K. how are you, Lisa? Come on and chat with us a little bit and tell us what's going on, Lisa K. All right, well, like Aaron said, happy hump day. Um, glad it's hump day. It's been an interesting three days of work week, but uh, we are here and excited about the conversation we're going to have tonight with this beautiful young lady uh, that Aaron will get introduced here in a minute. Um, yeah, we, we this is that emotional residue we, we talk about so much, and, and it's the cost of uh, loving and caring about people and we are definitely um, in a loving, caring way right now in our in our community, um, particular Mecklenburg County. Um, and this is uh, not just affecting us, the conversations we're going to have tonight, but it's it's all over the world. But right now it's live and in action um, in our community in front of us. And Aaron and I are, are very privileged to be able to support some efforts that are going to go on in our community that we'll talk a little bit about tonight. But um, but yeah, tonight we're going to have a good conversation and we hope that uh, there'll be something that will touch you in a way, whether it's to bring awareness to your own life uh, around trauma or vicarious trauma that we'll talk about. Uh, and some steps to take care of yourself. Or maybe you'll hear something tonight that you may want to jump in and help in, in our community. Either way, it's going to be a good conversation. And we just invite you to, to chat. Let us know you're out there. Um, share this, as Aaron said. You never know who's going to hear something that can really change something in their life. Give them something to think about and to work on. And that there is hope. Uh, because all of us are feeling some some traumas, uh, some vicarious traumas from the walks that we're all walking right now in our own um, lives, our communities, our own homes right now. So tune in, let us know you're out there and uh, let's get started. All right. Thank you, Lisa Kay. So many of you have heard about uh, 10 City, right? If you're here in Charlotte, but there are 10 cities all over the United States where our brothers and sisters who are experiencing homelessness um, find refuge and uh, a community um, generally out in the elements through with um, um, living in tents and on the street. And so we have people, um, we call them, I call them the angels. We have people who um, step up in life to make sure that that existence is, has humanity attached to it and that people are fed and clothed and, and loved. And one of those, those strong angels here in the Charlotte area is, is Ms. Deb Woolard. And so Deb is um, the executive director, founder of Block Love Charlotte, and she volunteered to come and hang out with us tonight in conversation. Deb, how are you? Can you hear me, buddy? It's, it's great, and thank you so much for, for hanging out. I've had the experience over the last few days to, to be down with Deb and watch the flow that I've heard about and seen on television and got reports about. And Deb, you're doing the doggone thing. Your heart is so big. And there's so many people that are depending on the love that you and those who work with you, you give. So jump in because I know you're working, right? You're the first person we ever did this with who was actually at work. So this is what you do and you're always at work, right? And so um, hopefully this is not just an opportunity for people who don't know to know you and the work you do, but also to hear why the work is important and for you to sit down for a minute and take a deep breath. So Deb, jump in. 
She's handling business, what she does. Jump in and just introduce yourself to the people, Deb, and tell them, tell them what you're doing. Tell them about Block Love Charlotte. So um, my name is Deborah Willard, and I am the founder of Block Love Charlotte. Um, and we do is we literally spread love throughout the city one block at a time. Hey, beautiful people. <laughs> I like that comment. I'm sorry. That's cute. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, we literally spread love throughout the city one block at a time. Um, we do focus a lot on those that are considered our houseless neighbors. Um, and the reason I say houseless is because where they dwell, where they sleep at night, that is considered their home. Um, but they are houses like they don't have a brick and mortar location um, where they have received mail at. Um, so they are our houses neighbors. And I just love what I do, what our, our team does on a daily basis, um, whether it's providing tent starts and sleeping bags, groceries, prescriptions, assisting individuals with getting um, their applications of our resumes updated. We do a, a large amount of things, but um, because of the help of the community and those that believe in the mission, we get a lot accomplished and a lot done. All right, Deb, and thank you for, for that. So let's dig into conversation. Um, what was going on with, with, with Deb when she decided that this was her, her call, when she decided that this was the passion? What was going on in your life at that point in time when you decided this is the way that you believe that your heart was taking you, that God was taking you? So one of the things I always tell people, and I pray every single day, when, especially when I'm serving, is I always say, um, we're all fortunate. We're all fortunate to be above the ground and not beneath. Um, and there's so many different situations that shaped where I'm at today. Um, but specifically about six years ago, as I was walking, um, you know, in uptown, I was working at a law firm and I was just looking and I was seeing some faces and I realized, hey, I'm seeing the same faces every single day. Um, and then I started having conversations, you know, and some of our conversations mirrored each other. But it's just like, listen, when there's a need out there, um, all I can do is ask, what is it that you, like, I'm seeing you out here every day, obviously the same clothes, obviously, you know, you're looking hungry or you're asking somebody, so what is it you specifically need? Because I ain't going to just assume you want some money or you want a meal. Maybe you just want conversation. I'm just that type of person where I'll ask. And then I ended up asking and then I ended up actually becoming friends with individuals I would support. Um, I wasn't having a whole lot um, going on in my life. Hey, baby, I'm sorry. I wasn't having a lot going on in my life. I mean, I had a lot going on in my life, but I still was looking out for, I'm on a call. I was looking out for others, um, which was really important for me in my life, just making sure I'm able to look out for others. No matter what I'm going through, my mind is always focused or mostly importantly focused on others. I don't know why God set me up that way, but apparently that's a switch I can't cut off. So anywho, um, as I'm walking up town, I'm seeing these individuals, loving on them, sharing my lunch, my breakfast, conversations, a little bit of pocket change. Um, and it just changed how I, I, I view people because growing up, you always hear people are less fortunate. But, you know, my family raised me to believe everybody's fortunate. Everybody has favor, some measure of favor. Um, that's why I, I hate hearing the term that favor ain't fair. Guess what? God always has a major, made a measure of favor for us all. It just looks different for where your life is and how he is, who he is in your life. So I always look at that favor is fair, you know. Um, but I'm also always looking for an opportunity to be a blessing. Um, so when I would see individuals, like I said, I form relationships. And then about three years into doing what I was doing with me and my kids, and my kids would go out with me. Um, in the midst of me doing that with my kids, um, I spoke at a city council meeting. I mean, we were supposed to be there about the warming stations. Um, but I saw it as an opportunity to talk about what I do every day, which was serve. And I noticed mm -hmm. those ugly, gosh, awful green benches in uptown that a lot of my neighbors slept on. And I noticed that they were either lifting them up or they were putting a bar in the middle of the bench to deter people from sleeping. So I shared that at a city council and how cool that was and how I would serve individuals, see them get out of the show Mars uptown or out of the Ivy building or um, people just talk about seeing and disgusting that they are. I forget about kids that are latchkey kids. It's one thing to be a latchkey kid at a home a latchkey kid in a, a city nasty motel you know you gotta wait for your parents to come home and the parents tell you don't you open the store don't you unlock the store don't you even answer your phone until i get home and who knows if they got afternoon snacks like some kids might even know not know what an afternoon snack looks like so mm -hmm. those were the things that you know me and my kids at the time we were going to the different motels that i knew of especially around the sugar creek area and giving snacks to kids you know leaving them in the front office i don't want y'all think i'm fed up nothing, nothing, nothing like that no i was leaving the snacks literally in the office um, making sure kids had something when they got off the bus. Um, and then um, at that city council meeting, 
I got to meet a young lady by the name of Stacy Phillips, and she told me about a group that would gather every Sunday morning at 8.30 at the corner, I believe, of 9th and Tryon at the preferred parking lot. And they would open up their trunk and give out donations. And as we were sitting there, we're giving out these donations. Um, I was like, what more? I'm always looking for a window of more. Um, mm-hmm. So I was like, what more could I do? So, you know, we were providing a better breakfast. And then one of the ladies like, you know, this breakfast is good. Let's try to see if we can get donations for a hot breakfast. That was Terry New Karen. So she was getting donations. So every so while we had a hot breakfast. Uh, we had a family coming from South, South Carolina and they would cater a hot breakfast. So we were just kind of all pulling our resources together. But when we started, it was maybe like 15 or 20. And it grew, it swelled to like 60, then about 80, then about 100, you know, and they became known as our block family. Why? Because we were gathering on the block, which I dubbed the block. Um, growing up, where did I hang out at? The block. Where did I party at? The block. Where did I get to know about all the latest gossip? Who's sleeping with who? Who messing with who? Who daddy out here roaming the streets? We learned oh, if you want to dip, dab, dabble, whatever you do, and you did it at the block. But mm-hmm. love was also to be found on the block. Everybody mm-hmm. told me, hey, you up there at the wall. I was like, what is the wall? Please explain to me what this is. But every time I heard about the wall, I heard it in negative connotation i never heard anything positive and i was like y'all know what we had to, we had the block we turn up we turn the music up we love on one another we hug each other it's rain sleet or snow well this was before covid um but rain shine sleet or snow we were out there and that consistency grew into what you have today which is block love charlotte that's a long yeah. explanation i'm sorry that's all right. We got more of it. So listen, I you you, you flow. When I, we when we talked yesterday, the first thing you said was, "I don't have no problem telling this thing." So no, nah, you have an open platform here, good sister. So Deb, so um, block block love Charlotte starts to form, right, and it starts to move. Okay, so then what's what was the transition during pandemic? What at what what adjustments needed to be made during pandemic? And talk to me about the story. Um, when the potter party, the, the porter parties were were removed, and, and what that looked like, that dehumanizing of our people. Um, what happened with that? Number one, and then how did pandemic shape what Block Love does? So, um, prior to the pandemic, we were serving at that particular time three times a week. Um, let me make sure I said that right. Yeah, three times a week we were doing two. Well, I take that back. We were serving on the block or what some people call it the wall we were serving three times a week at um tuesdays wednesdays and um sundays we were still doing our sunday breakfast um but we were we were going into the camps on tuesday and wednesday because it would be so cold um and we wanted to get them like hot meals so i would make um chili and one of my partners was making soup um and we just wanted because some people would not come get a meal at the wall because it would be too cold so we started going into the camps that was in late 2019 um and then we were noticing more camps popping up so that's why i said we were serving more times a week um but we were just doing random pop-ups at camps you know to get people's bellies warm um so we were already we had already re- increased our number of days on the street and then the pandemic hit and it was this stay in place order and it's just like what does this look like for us because at the end of the day Hunger doesn't stop. You know, homelessness doesn't stop just because we're in the midst of a pandemic. And so I talked to the team and I was like, y'all, I don't know how we're going to make it happen. Um, but we got to make this thing happen where there no one will go hungry. But March 8th, we were out that day. And when the guys was like, yo, man, if they locking everything down, y'all, I'm going to knock off the Starbucks. I was like, no, we're not going to do this ignorance. Like, if y'all are hungry, I'll get, if y'all believe in me, if you trust me, I'm going to get food out there. Um, so we put groups like uh, um, the Community Hub with Charles Robinson, um, which really played key in the very beginning because not only did he have a site where we could have food delivered to, he also had restaurant connections. And some of the restaurants were fearful, so they were cooking up the items and getting them to us. Um, so we had hot meals, we had salads, um, and we just started connecting that way. At that time, I didn't even have a cash app. I didn't have a PayPal. It was just you know, we got to get people fed. And we were able to do that, not just on the block, but we um, immediately ramped up our volunteers and we were delivering meals to people that were scared to come out of their homes, you know, whether they were elderly or families with small children. Um, a lot of people were scared to go pick up their prescriptions. We were doing whatever. We were boots. Uh, oh God, I hate that term. I'm sorry. We were literally doing what we had to do. Um, and then 
you know, some of the organizations that I was a part of was everybody was just jumping in, um, but we did not stop. So we did the three meals a day cycle for a little over three months. Um, but in all of this, I was still working a full-time job at a law firm uptown working in IT. Um, I've been in IT for 23 years, and I'm going to tell y'all right now, listen, I was making good money. I was making good money. I, I was making, <laughs> I don't have that anymore, and it's not because I had some type of nest egg. It's just my passion was for what I was doing. And I was like, man, you know, God is calling me to this, and where there's vision, there's provision. And I don't know how much I was really believing that at the time, but I believed the assignment and the call of my life, so I had to step away from um my job to do this and you know we all made sacrifices we had those that were themselves you know really affected like we we've got my operations manager has a detailing business well nobody's trying to get their car detailed in the midst of a pandemic um you know what i'm saying even my vp no limit larry you know he's not just power 98 he's all over the country doing gigs and shows and hosting and everything else that was cut you know, um, a lot of my volunteers, they were furloughed. Um, they were able to ramp up their volunteer hours, but we were being affected as well. And not only that, putting our own lives at risk, because one thing that did not happen was to have our neighbors educated. So when we noticed they weren't educated and they had a lot of fears and concerns, we Google research, did whatever we had to do to give them information. We provided them that information. Then um, we're finding out all of this. We're doing all of this in the midst of us doing this. We, we see the Port of Johns and then a couple of weeks later, we don't. And I was like, you know, what is happening here? Like, I, you know, what is happening? So I couldn't believe what I was seeing. We went live, um, the news station got a hold of our live. Cause like I said, it literally was like, you blink and the Port of Johns was gone. And I was like, weren't we just setting up for dinner we seen the Port of John there and did they just sneak it off in front of us? We not realize it. And I'm gonna tell you what really what really made us realize it when one of the girls said, mm, Mama D, you got some toilet paper. I said, uh, yeah, I said, ain't nothing in the Port of John. She said, the Port of John gone. I said, now nah, I swore we just pulled up, and we see the Port of John, now the Port of John is gone. <clears throat> but um the problem I have behind that is not only do we have people sleeping outside, so oh, I'm sorry, so let me back up. At the beginning of the pandemic, those that were already out there that needed to be near resources were giving a tent tarp and a sleeping bag. They were asked by whomever, because I'm not getting in that argument, whomever to set up so they could be closest to the resources. That resources, urban ministry, which is now part of Roof Above with the men's shelter. So um, once we got there and saw how close the tents were and we were looking at the CDC guidelines, we were like, hey, they're not six feet apart. Who told you all to do this? We found out from our neighbors who, you know, told them to do that. And then we're like, well, what did they tell y'all about meals? You know, and there was a lot of no information, not misinformation, no information. Like it just wasn't given to them. Um, and then to have them there and to remove the porta johns and my girl's scared because they got to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, you know, and take care of other things. Now, let, let me let me respond to this, because when we did the live, we were getting a uh, kickback from folks talking about what I heard is needles and stuff in there and it's this and it's that and it's that. I can't control that. But at the end of the night, if I got to pee, I want to have somewhere, excuse me for being so frank, I got to have somewhere I can't. Don't tell me, you know, I can't go use it. If, if it's my choice to use a dirt water, John, then that's what I'm going to do. But you know, the city had once again, I think the city finally did bring them out. It might have been the county because that became an argument too. Bought the porters back out. They got back out there and they were being serviced. You know, I actually had to go. I went in when it was nasty because I had to take pictures and I had to go in again when they were clean. And when I saw they were being clean, now did that go down to where, you no, know, yeah, they were being clean, but, you know, it didn't matter. Porter Johns remained there until Tent City was dis dismantled. Um, but that was a fight that we shouldn't have had to have because, like I told, um, you know, uh, the so called powers that be, you know, you don't want. Uh, women discarding the things that they could discard on the ground. I want feces on the ground. You know, you want to talk about some of the stuff that, that could bound out there. You, you kind of got to, you know, how, how do you deal with it? How do you deal with it? If, if you're not providing them housing, at least provide them somewhere to pick. So, so Deb, so now pandemic hits, what's the movement like? How do we, how are our folks moving? What resilience are you seeing in in, in our people down there? Because um, in reality, 
what they're dealing with was a pre-pandemic anyway, right? So now this, this this virus comes in and now they have to move. You're, you and others are providing services, making sure there's a lot of love and a lot of humanizing going, but what are you seeing as far as the resilience of the people or the defeat um, of the people? What are you seeing within the people down, down during this period of time? So I always tell people, you know, change is not easy, period. A lot of us have a lot of resources, a lot of family, a lot of everything in place. I see it. I'm good. Just pray about it. Go that way. Uh, change is um, a lot of times uh, not change. Lock this door again. Is a lot of times not easy, even for individuals that um, you know have homes or have you know are comfortable. Change ain't easy for anybody. Um, one of the reasons why I worked in IT is because I love change. I love change. I love a different environment, but not everybody loves change. Not everybody can adapt to change. It's not easy. So, um, so um, it becomes very hard for individuals, especially sorry, especially when they um, are dealing with other issues. Um, but let homelessness be an issue, and then you're talking about change. Resilience. The number one word I can say for these individuals that have um, taken opportunity to get a bed, because not only did they make an amazing choice, an amazing decision, but they did it when everybody wasn't cheering this situation on. They did it in the midst of freezing, cold, hard rain. I'm not lying. They did it, you know, with mud being, uh, now I'm not talking about like a fight mud slinging, little mud slinging, like we all were muddy, we were all wet, we were all tired, um, but they did it. They did it even knowing they couldn't bring all of their belongings. They did it. They did it. And some of our harder cases to deal with, they did. It. So for them to even take a step was absolutely amazing to me. I've seen triumph, I've seen defeat, I've seen um, ups, I've seen down, I've seen a plethora of emotions. A plethora of emotions. I, it's been up and down, but we take it minute by minute. I was at one time saying, we're going to take this thing day by day. No, I have learned. Sometimes I got to take it second by second, but definitely minute by minute, because if we try to outthink God, we will fail at this thing. You know, we have to stay in our lane and let God do what he does. And he's an amazing father. You know, we can't repaint this picture. You know, let his his brush do the strokes of our lives. And let's take the try, stop trying to grab that brush. A lot of us want to grab the brush and paint a different picture, paint it that, oh, it's about this organization or it's about that organization. Oh, the county messed up or this this organization is doing this. Or, you know what, stop trying to paint what you want to paint and let God paint this picture. Let him have complete. I'm sorry, y'all. Can I talk about God on you? Let God, sure you can talk about anything. God, let, you can talk like, about what you want to flow, all right? Go ahead. My bad, too late. Um, <laughs> yeah. But we have to let God flow the way that he's supposed to flow and out the way. You know, because at the end of the day, it ain't about us. It's about those that we claim we're here to see. We have to continue and always keep that in the forefront of our mind. Because at the end of the day, it ain't about Deborah Denise, Debbie D, uh, Deborah Woolard, Blot Love Charlotte, whatever name, Miss Deb, Mama Deb, Mama D, whatever name I go by. It ain't about me or anybody on my staff. It is about the individuals that I call my Block family that I love and serve every single day. That I said I will be here with them until the very end. Deb, I saw something yesterday. I'm going to turn it over to Lisa. Um, let her check in with our people who are um, coming in on chat and um, also to talk about some vicarious trauma. Um, but I saw something, it wasn't yesterday, it was the day before yesterday. So um, there was a situation where you were talking to someone and you made the point very clear, um, I need you to see me and I need you to see me. And the thought from me observing that the person wasn't seeing you because they thought that you was um, a person who, uh, right, was houseless, right? And so they did not see you. And you made it very clear, regardless of who I am, you need to be able to see me. And that is so much of the issue, right? So we drive past Graham or we drive past Tryon and we look straight ahead because we don't want to see. But the reality of it is, we we must see our our brothers and and our sisters. Listen, Lisa, I'm gonna let you jump on in if you don't mind, and come on and hang out with Deb a little bit, and let's talk about our chat and some tra um, vicarious trauma. 
Well, thanks. Deb, I tell you what, you are uh, something else. I have never heard in my life uh, someone say that they embrace and they love change. Um, we normally hear the opposite of that. You you won me over right right there um, because I I feel like that myself that I embrace change because of my lived experience and just where my life has taken me. So um, I am so glad that there's an, somebody else out there that can say that and um, we all can learn from that. And that's exactly what's going on right now. Big changes um, in, in all aspects of, of those folks lives that are, are out there in yours. And so um, you said something about um, you just can't switch take this uh you can't switch this off um looking out for others that you found yourself down uh, uptown and our beat with our beautiful uptown and and all the big high-rise buildings and all the different things you know you worked at a place that um i'm sure was prestigious and everything was beautiful in there and and all of those things and you made your way out there with um people that you saw that nobody else saw that walked past them every day, just like you and never even looked. Not only did you see them, you saw them and that's a big difference. And that's what you were alluding to uh, what Aaron heard you say. It's a big difference. You need, people need that. Um, so before I go any farther, <laughs> let me just chime out to some of our people. Um, Kristen, um, uh, that works with PRN, she she uh, grabbed a hold of the first thing that I wrote down that you said uh, was our, our houseless neighbors. Um, and she states that um, that this is really helpful in breaking the stigma around those members of the community. Um, and so I've never heard it put that way. Uh, houseless neighbors. I really. Um, yeah, that's my new term. <laughs> yeah, I really like that. Um, because, you know, we talk about, um, you know, at PRN, we, um, a lot of the folks that we have the privilege to walk beside are houseless neighbors. And um, that feels so good rolling out of my mouth than some of the other terms that we've tried to come up with. It didn't seem so stigmatizing, right? But I thank you for sharing that with us. Um, but we got folks, uh, Miss Mandy Douglas is saying, Deb, she must know you well, and she's hollering out. Thanks, Miss Mandy. Amanda Martin, my people, um, that's for sure. Um, but yeah, we got some folks uh, giving us hearts and loves. And um, so you guys just keep chiming in and give Miss Deb all the love you can. I'm just hoping that, um, you know, something will be laid on your heart tonight that you um, think that you can chime in with because, you know, we we all need to lock our arms around our um, uh, our folks that are, are in this midst of this change right now. Uh, but, Deb, you, um, you talked a lot about not being uh, able to switch this off. You have a higher calling. Um, you walked away from a job that... Paid you well. I'm sure it did. IT, you uh, you got a lot going on up here. That IT brain, right? Uh, for you to walk away from that. And um, and I admire that, that you put it all down and followed your calling. Um, and I believe that uh, we are a better people because of your courage. And I want to thank you personally for doing that. Um, because you are leading us, you are inspiring us. Uh, your energy alone makes me ready to, you know, just come sit right down there beside you <laughs> right now. So, um, and that's what we need, that inspiration, because you surely are blessed with it, and we appreciate it. Um, you also made the statement about you're always looking for a window of more, window of more. Um, I love the fact that um, you just took a spin um, and, and, and even talked about the wall in a positive way, which we needed to do that, um, as well as where your your block family came from, your block love came from. You have been um, all in it, you know, all in it. And you have been, um, I see so much growth of where you started, I can just imagine seeing you when you when you told your story. I could literally see you in Uptown talking to people, hand, handing them that change, offering them a biscuit or your warm ears to your warm heart, right? But I can also see how quickly you're a powerhouse. 
um, and you're not ashamed of it. And we need, and I don't want to be, you know, you know, I, I'm just going to put it out. We need more women like you and you have inspired us because you are a powerhouse and we all can learn from you. But I want to say this. Um, you talked about your staff. Um, so have you seen um, within yourself and your staff as you guys have been the warriors in the beginning and now through the pandemic, now through this big change uh, of what's going on right now and you're in there every day with you and your staff, how are you guys loving each other? How are you loving yourself? How are you loving each other? Making sure that something is pouring into you guys because you guys are definitely pouring, 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 pouring as the leader of this group. You know, what are some things that you're modeling? What are some things that you're doing for yourself and for your staff? And is there a way that uh, uh, the community can also help you guys to be able to take care of yourselves because you guys are rock stars and we need to, admire, you know, we need to do something to make sure you guys are being filled up as well. So talk a little bit about that because we know trauma, you know, everybody on your staff, including yourself, has experienced some type of trauma and you've got this calling. You've seen things. You've been there. You've done that. And there's this calling you have. So is your staff. I can't imagine someone not being for real, for real and coming on board as your staff member. They wouldn't last long if they weren't for real. So talk a little bit about the trauma in this and how you guys are taking care of each other and taking care of yourselves. It's funny you say that my, my team members over there laughing. <laughs> so one of the things are we are a functioning, dysfunctional, functioning family. I'm functioning in the end and I did functioning at the beginning. We are functioning, dysfunctional, functioning family. Um, and that's what we've become. It's not only for those that we serve and call our block family, it is for ourselves. We consider ourselves family. Um, we support one another. We love on each other. We connect with each other. We check on each other. But I think the greatest thing that we do is we celebrate one another. Um, and that's really how we connect. We really celebrate each other. In fact, one of our uh, members, her birthday is today. You know, um, she's been going through a lot herself. Um, she actually, um, had a minor stroke um, week before last, but she hasn't been on our street team for a while. Um, and even then we celebrate her, you know, you just have to celebrate one another, um, call and check on one another. Um, this thing is not easy. So we do a lot of laughing. We do a lot of, you know, once we're done, I tell my team, I might can't pay you, but I can teach you. Um, so we go out and we eat and we kick back, and we enjoy. Um, and that's one of the things like, I, I don't have a, a big budget. I can't be paying folks and still be taking care of others. Like we, we're not putting the stuff on our backs. We, we literally, put it out here in the streets, but I can't feed them. So me and, me and the staff and the team, we go out and we just really have a good time. But I think the key has really been in celebrating each other. Can you increase Sarah as you over there dividing socks? I got her dividing socks. Um, but we do, we celebrate one another. I'm big on that. Um, I grew up where my old pastor would always say this. He said, don't go where you're tolerated, go where you're celebrated. And that kind of sunk in with me. Um, and I take that into any relationship that I have because I feel like if they can't celebrate you or if you can't celebrate me, uh -uh, cause I like to celebrate, I like to try to have a good time. So if you can't celebrate me, you cannot be in my life. Like I love to have a really good time. I love to laugh, um, which is why we, we treat the block like it is. We not only celebrate each other, we celebrate those on the block. When a staff member say they need a break or a vacation, we are very open and flexible to work around their break or their vacation. I even encourage those, hey, if I see somebody's on the verge of a burnout, now I can't pay for your vacation, but I can't tell you to take one. How about that? I can't pay for it, but I'm going to need you and your wife, your boo, your bae, whoever to go spend time together. If you don't have somebody, spend some time by yourself, read a book, meditate, pray, do whatever you need to do to gather yourself because it's not easy out here. We have a lot of trauma out here on these streets, even prior to the pandemic. You know, people volunteer and they think they they think they seen it all. Because I look all a lot of my volunteers have come from some crazy backgrounds, including myself. And oh, I, you know, the favorite phrase, oh, I done seen it all. I'm good, Miss Deb. I said, mm -mm, mm -mm, this is different here, boo. I'm gonna need you to open your eye, um, look your eyelash, do whatever you got to do so you can see it all. You get it all out here. You are going to see it all. Um, 
and it changes from day to day. You're never going to, you're never, this is worse than a box of chocolates because you really don't know what you're going to get. So that one that you bite into the coconut and spit back out, you can't spit this out. You have already received it. Once your eyeballs see it, you can't unsee it. You are like, I, I wish I had seen it. I wish I had seen it. It's too late. It's already seen. So um, we do though. We, I think our biggest thing is loving on not just those we serve, but loving on one another um and we we you know you got you got to take a break you know my team gets on me i have to rest i'm an asthmatic and um it flares up like because um those that i support a lot you smoke a lot um you know a lot of times we are out in the elements you know the weather gets really really crazy um but through prayer and just making sure you know deb you have you used your inhaler did you you know do you need a breathing treatment? Treatment. Um, they, you know, I got one to sit there and listen to me. They, they sleep, they roll up behind me and listen, make sure I'm not wheezing. Um, but we are still, you know, taking time for ourselves, taking time to just breathe. Um, you know, if I see someone that might have a crisis, you know, you know, I'm gonna send that word of prayer, I'm gonna send that scripture to them, but I'm also gonna tell them, look, you might need to step back for just a moment. Let's breathe, let's take a break. But tell me what you need. What do you need? How help me help you? Jerry McGuire. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, I love it. Um, yeah, I love the that you said it, y'all were the dysfunctional, functional, dysfunctional family. Is that what you said? It's functional, dysfunctional, functioning family. Functioning. Okay, gotcha. I like that. I like that. With Aaron, we'll fit in just fine. <laughs> it explains a lot. It explains yeah, a lot. Yeah. That's yeah. that's I think that's why we're drawn to to Deb. <laughs> so because we get that. We get that at PRN. That that kind of describes us. Uh, I love the the fact that you guys um you even take your history from your family, things that have been poured into you. Uh isn't that amazing how things will flow out of our spirit in the right time that came from a grandmother, great grandmother, grandfather, aunt, uncle, whoever, and all of a sudden it just you wouldn't think it, it just flows and that's just how it's supposed to be but i love the fact that you said you know don't go where you're tolerated go where you're celebrated uh -huh. and i love that fact because i i guarantee that that is how you present that's that's what you dole out every day to our folks because they they definitely know what it feels like just to be tolerated Right. right. Not celebrated. And um, so I'm excited about it. And I think that what you are doing with laughter, celebrating each other, your team members, y'all share. You know, they already know your health issues. So they're already mm -hmm. doing a sneak attack on you. They're watching you. But you're doing the same to them. You're close. Right. And I think that's really important. Those of us who are uh, already have our own trauma and we're out here, whether it's with uh this situation or others that we recognize that we have to take care of ourselves and each other. And that's having a relationship, a real good relationship that we know when we need to tap out, right? Or you need to say, you need a vacation. Can't pay for it, but I can give you a vacation. And you come back when you are rested and better because you guys are pouring out every day. So I'm glad to hear that you've got some great processes that are very simple and easy for us all to do. And I love the laughter part of it because we need it. But Aaron, we got folks chiming in, just saying hey to us. Um, they're here listening. Guys, come, you know, if you're just popping on, uh, ask questions. Uh, Miss Deb is an amazing individual. Uh, go back and watch. If you didn't catch the first part of this, please share it and keep it going. And um, Aaron, take us uh, to our next thing here. Thank you. And again, as Lisa said, for all who are on, make sure you're sharing and I uh, want to say hello. Hello to Amanda. Hello, Karen. Hey, Mandy. My daughter, Kristen, is on. Hey, baby queen. Um, Darlene is on and Roberta from New York. I'm glad you're on, Roberta. Hey, um, so, Deb, I want to ask you this this part. So, all right, we're up to, the, we're up to now. The abatement comes, the conversations comes, all the with all the stuff that's happening downtown comes and the decision is made, Ten City has to has to has to be gone. What was that like for you observing and how did you now get in gear? Because you're gonna move with your people. So how did what what was that whole situation like? First hearing that it had to happen and then making the move to uh make it happen. 
one thing is I'm big about transparency and I had already begun a relationship with it because I did the county town hall, not even two weeks prior. Um, and I thought we were at a transparent state in um, our lives. And um, I actually was um, just walking out of a food line to get ready to serve dinner because since we still we were still serving dinner every single evening uptown, breakfast three times a week and lunch on Mondays. So um, thinking that I had that relationship um, and to get that particular call, um, actually, I didn't, you know, I didn't get it from any of the, the places I thought it, thought it should have came from. It was, you know, folks texting me. I was like, why is my phone being in the bank? And I know it must have been an emergency. Um, and it was people telling me, you know, about that uh, um, um, abandonment order. And I, I, it, I, it floored me. It floored me to a point where I think I actually lost my breath. Like I thought somebody in my life had been shot or killed. That's how I feel. I'm, I'm, that's the only way I can explain it. I was literally floored. Um, I was so floored to the point where I thought I was crying and a tear hadn't dropped. And that's when I, that's when I became mad. Um, I was like, you know what? Um, somebody asked me where I'm from. I'm from Raleigh. Somebody made this gear for me. I'm sorry. Chat, distract me. Somebody made the specific gear. I'm glad you asked this. I'm a walking billboard today. I'm from Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, but yeah, that floored me because like I said, I thought a relationship was there. Um, the relationship is still there because I realized that the call actually came down from the um, health department, but still uh, our other county. Um, was it fair? Heck no. Was it right? Heck no. Um, who did it benefit? I'm still trying to figure out. But at the end of the day, all I could do was get in place, be in place, and be on the ready and make sure that I wasn't left out of any other calls. Like, if y'all want to leave me out some calls, listen, I, it's not going to be pretty because, you know, we we – it's a relationship. And if you leave me out of the relationship, apparently we have been divorced and you have yet to send me papers and I ain't signed nothing. So since I ain't signed nothing, I need this relationship to remain intact and for everybody to get their entire lives. But we literally, the team went right into go mode. Like we did not stop. We went right into go mode to do what we have to do. Um, Baby, that's um, some more dinners right there. So we had to immediately go into go mode. Um, And what that looked like was letting our neighbors know what was going on, have that conversation. Um, it was a hard conversation to have because it was true. You know, sometimes we heard, oh, they're doing away with this camp or Tent City, or you would do away with the camp, but you knew you had another camp to go to. But to do away with where the majority of those we served were at in 72 hours, I knew it was true. Um, and we just mobilized. We did whatever we had to do, and we've been sticking with the process, which is why I'm on site right now looking like I'm about to go to sleep, but I still got work to do. I got a couple more calls to make. I can't stop. And I told those that I love that we'll be here. We'll be here. It's not about us. It's about you all. We will be here. You know, I'll be here until the folks tell me I got to go. I ain't going nowhere. I shall not be moved. I might sing that old spiritual. I don't know. I'm not singing that. I'm, I'm, I, I need some gangster. I can't sing that. I need some hood. I'm sorry. We'll trap me. Uh, Sidetrack. Sorry. That's all right. Listen, hey, I've I have watched. I have witnessed. I have seen. Right, the 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 work that is being done. So, um, what kind of help is needed? What what specifically? Um, you ain't got to be specific. You can be general. What kind of help is needed? Uh, what kind of reinforcements are, are are needed to come in and to support the work that um, Block Love is doing? So the biggest thing, the biggest, the be biggest and best way to support um, Block Love is privacy. Like I know I'm on this call right now because I'm on location. And y'all notice I lower my laptop. You know, I don't want anybody to see where I'm at. Privacy, not right, privacy right. for me. But privacy for those that we serve because it's already swirling out on social media, whether it's my location or anybody else's location. Respect the privacy of those that you claim that you're trying to support and stick up for. Privacy has got to be number one. It's got to be key. Don't put these people on front street. They have been through hell and back. Let's let them get some rest, sleep really well, have a good bath, what is, but give them the privacy that they not only need, but they deserve. Um, privacy. That's how people can help. Don't give into the myths, the lies, or the rumors. Um, you know, somebody said uh, I require permission. I require permission for anything. If you want to help, help. But it's it's best if you ask. 
that's where I mean, you know, you don't need permission, but it is best if you ask those that are already on location or that are already part of the process how best to help. Um, don't show up to locations. If it's been shared on social media, do not just show up on site, especially not over here. Because look, I ran off one of your employees. He probably still far from this day. <laughs> but um, don't just show up on site. It's not fair to them. Like, right. I understand you're in the right place, but if we start getting all these donations and everything again, what you think is going to happen? Like, Thank let you. the groups that are on the ground and doing the actual work funnel through, reach out to them, and don't be offended if we have to tell you no right now, because the biggest way you all can help us is to support us financially, because guess what? Listen, we want to supplement a meal tonight. We ended up supplementing with KSC. You know, people are doing what they have to do, but don't just assume that, you know, oh, I want 50, 11 million sandwiches. I don't know about y'all. I'm sandwiched out. Like, mm -hmm. don't send me a whole bunch of clothes. Like, right now, Let's 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 keep things to a limit. Let's think keep things manageable. Let's 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 work with who we need to work with. And let me tell you all, a lot of times you can work to help our neighbors by already helping those organizations and entities that have already been doing work. Find out what PRN needs. Find out what Roof Above needs. Now, I ain't gonna be funny. Roof Above needs no more money. How about y'all get some of that? The blah, 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 like whoever's in the grant world. Um, sorry, sidebar. Um, so no, you that's know, not but, sidebar. That's, that's that needed to be said. All right, we good. Go ahead. But, but volunteer with community support service. I am actually a volunteer. Yes, baby. I'm actually a volunteer as well as an advocate with community support services. Uh, domestic violence speaker bureau. You know, see how you can get involved. See where volunteerism is needed because it's not always with block love there's so many other organizations that are doing the work so find out how you can best volunteer how you can best make a difference um because it doesn't always have to be physical donations because right now i can't even walk into my house my living room or my dining room because it looks like an Amazon warehouse but i am grateful so that means at this point in time i don't really need the physical donations but if somebody comes up to me and has an emergency with, that may need to be financial um i believe mr aaron was aware of a situation i may have had to take care of last night but that got worked out but what if i would have needed those funds to make sure that individual was taken care of hey, we put, put people on buses planes trains and automobiles to put somebody on a motorcycle so listen if they if we gassed it up so if they need to go somewhere we need to have those funds available or if we need to pay staff or we need to pay a security to come in um extra security because i'll make sure my neighbors get whatever we have to do it takes funds to do it it takes funds to make things happen um you know people say well i, I need them to have this where if you find out they don't have it reach out to one of the organizations and, and fund them so that they can continue to do the work. There's a lot of amazing organizations out here to, still doing the work because guess what? There's still camps out there. It's still houseless neighbors right now that need assistance. We are still serving meals every evening on the block. Every evening at 5.30. My team is on the way over here now. But every evening at 5.30, we are still serving people on the block. So it lets you know the need the need doesn't just stop just because they demolished a few tents um, around Uptown. Because, And I say a few because if you look at the number of actual homeless people in Charlotte, Mecklenburg County and surrounding areas, that number, that, that little number ain't got, and we ain't put a dent in our house's mm -hmm. neighbor's problem, not even a dent. Um, I believe one, one record was 3,000, but CMS at one point was recording over 5,000 students. So if you got students, how many parents is there? Come on, like, let's, 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 you basic man. Um, it, it, it doesn't take a rocket science to figure this thing out. We got a lot of homeless people that we need to reach. And homeless may be hotel, motel, living in car, um, what they call chopping couch serving um, from address to address. If you do not have your own address, your own brick and mortar building, um, whether that be a trailer, apartment, condo, whatever it is that you can call your own outside of living outside under a bridge in a tent, then you are considered a houseless neighbor. And we have to keep them at the forefront and remember. So the best way to help is to ask, not necessarily saying you got to ask Block Love permission to do anything. Honey, you ain't got to ask me, Jack, honey. Ask God. If you need to be directed, it says, look, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lead not to your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him. He'll direct your path. So I'm gonna need you to ask God to stop asking me. Ask God and he'll direct you. But you know, if you don't believe and you selfish and you self-righteous, then guess what? You're going to ask the wrong person, which is going to be yourself. And you're going to make a mess and a mockery of what God is trying to paint. Yeah. 
I'm sorry, I got that it. message back up, didn't I? I'm sorry, I brought it right back <laughs> home to you. Boom, bam. It's right there. Boom. <laughs> <in your face. laughs> All right, so here's the deal. I'm gonna turn it over to Lisa for as we're gonna start um, um putting the plane in the hangar and let Lisa chime in for a few. But Deb, I wanna throw you this, right? I'm gonna tell you again tomorrow when I actually see you. Here's the deal. There are people who always ask, right? They say, Lord, will you send somebody to fix that? You say, here go I, right? Here I'm gonna go. But I also want you to know that we always need leadership. And there are the Debs of the community of the world that is providing the leadership because there are some people who don't know what to do. And even as they go before God, still in a crux of how do I, what do I? And out, out of that rises a Deb Willard who somebody is able to see. And it might not be in the arena that you're in, but to be able to see that passion, to see that spirit, to be able to glean something from that so that whatever arena they're in, whatever field they're in, they can now emulate that same energy and effort. So for me personally, the leadership that you're bringing to this community that many people have prayed for is to be appreciated and admired. And I just wanted to tell you that right now. What you got, Lisa? Well, what I have is I'd like to sit here for another couple of hours and listen to Deb. <laughs> She'll be asleep. I'm telling you. I know she go, she's going to get lower and lower and lower and lower. <laughs> I'm drinking no. energy cranberry juice. I didn't even know they could put energy stuff in cranberry juice. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> we need to get Miss Deb some more cranberry, energy cranberry juice for sure. <laughs> Keep her going. Well, I look forward to meeting you as well, Deb. Um, I can't wait to meet you live and in person. And you will tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, tomorrow. So you'll see me tomorrow for sure. So, but I do thank you. Uh, Everybody is loving your energy, and I, you know, I what I pick up is is that not only are you, um, you're this, you're this mouthpiece, um, and 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 you got you're doing it. You're not just speaking it; you're doing it. But you also are taking very good care of yourself. You're taking good care of your staff. Uh, you're you. I love your frankness. You know, you kept going, oh, I shouldn't have said that or I went too far. No, you said exactly what you needed to say tonight. And we do appreciate that. Uh, we got folks uh, t saying that you, you know, you deserve all of the wonderful things that are going to come your way. And I know that if people share this, uh, I know all of our PRM people will. Everybody here tonight, Deb, you share it as well. We're going to get your word out. And, um, and you're right, that financial the financial blessings need to come. They need to come. And we folks need to wait to hear specific things that they might could do or bring. But in the meantime, support those folks who are doing the work. Support, you know, Block Love and all PRN, whoever uh, who's doing the work with that with the dollars. Right. Because we need that to keep going. So I appreciate you being courageous in saying that and putting it out there because it's exactly what we needed to hear. And so everybody share that. Um, I love the fact that we're not blasting um, the county, the city. It is what it is. That's right. But what we're doing right now is it, it, we can't change how things, you know, if we could go back hindsight, maybe we would change things, but we can't. So here we are. And I love your attitude. Uh, I hope that it will adjust others' attitudes that are spending time with the lip service. Uh, it's time to quit talking and uh, see our community as w the needs that they have and quit finger pointing and blaming and let's just see what we can do. So I appreciate you tonight and I hope everybody heard something that you feel like you can have a part in. And if it's nothing but sharing this on your social media, that's a big thing because you never know. Somebody might be writing a big old check tomorrow just because they heard and they really saw and heard all at the same time and what the, what was needed so so um is this my warm line time it is it's warm line time you know what time it is i right, said time this hour went by quick um but yeah we just want to give a shout out to our warm line uh prn warm line free confidential 24 7. uh please share this number uh miss deb you share this number if you don't already have it if you feel like someone needs it you share it these are uh run by prn as our peer support specialist people with lived experience our job is to use our warm airs because we have warm hearts and we're here to listen and to validate because you're worth it and help you just process not to tell you how to do it or what to do because 
we don't know you do but we just know that if we give you a safe place space to speak what's on your heart and mind that you have your own answers and we're here to walk with you on that so uh the number's up there 833-390-7728 uh 24 7 give us a call if you need someone to talk to or process things with for sure but thank you thank you lisa k all right deb give us the last word as we park it as we put the plane in the hangar what's the last word you got for the people my friend Hey, the last words, if you want to know more about what we're doing, please look us up at blocklovecot.org. Um, you can also check us out on Facebook or on um, Instagram, Block Love Charlotte. Um, we're always updating what we're doing, how we're doing it, where we're doing it, when, and who we're doing it for. So please just check us out. We love um, all of the support that we can get. We are all about spreading love throughout this city, one block at a time. Deb, listen, we appreciate your time. I ask and you said, sure, we can make that happen. We appreciate that. PRN is there to support any way that we can. We will, Lisa and I, uh, 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 the squad, will see you tomorrow. I want to thank you for your time. Bless everybody for us. Everybody, make sure you share this. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please like our Facebook page so we can keep getting these, um, these conversations out. Lisa K, thank you so much. See you again next Wednesday. Deb, much love. I will talk to y'all next week. Bye-bye.